I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my statutory interpretation and regulation class about Gustafson v. Alloyd Company, a U.S. Supreme Court case from 1995. Now, please note, I have right on the slide here, um, we're going to talk about, we're studying this case to really learn about three kind of traditional canons of construction, all in one case, the consistent use canon, the surplusage canon, and the nociter associates canon. Quick word for my students before we proceed. Number one, this is actually a pretty famous case about securities regulation. I don't expect you to know anything about securities regulation, but if you take that course in law school, there's a pretty good chance you're going to read and learn about the Gustafson case because it was kind of a big case in that area. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is try to explain only the facts and the little bit of law that you actually need to know to understand this case, because in my course, we're studying the case to look at how the court um, handles statu interpreting a confusing statute and the statutory interpretation techniques uh, that the court is using. That's our interest in this video, but you will actually maybe study this uh, case in other courses in law school like securities regs um, uh, be for the holding um, that matters. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, I'm sorry, but there's three different canons of construction here. So this is a little bit more complicated to talk about than most of the cases I study or I teach, which are really just about one basic point or takeaway. And so it's a little more complicated to explain. So let's get right to it now. Okay, so preview, here's our canons. I'm worried that you're gonna give up on me. And so these are the three takeaways from this case. The consistent use canon, the surplusage canon, which some people annoyingly insist on calling the anti-surplusage canon or the anti-superfluity canon, um, or <clears throat> nociter associates. So let me give you the quick and dirty on what each of these mean uh, before we go on so you're not lost, just what you need to know so we're not lost. The consistent use canon is the idea that a courts can, should presume that uh, a legislature uh, used a term consistently throughout a single enactment or act. So um, it, now this can be kind of taken to an almost laughable extreme sometimes where we are trying to say that um, any given word that you encounter in the statute means exactly the same thing every single time you encounter it in the statute. Uh, by the way, sometimes this is called the same act statute. So we're looking at something broader than just the sentence or clause here. We actually might flip to other sections of this, the same act um, overall to see how a term is used. By the way, a lot of, of federal enactments have a definition section as one of the first sections of the act. And so if you find something in the definition section, that, then you might be invoking the consistent use canon for every time that term occurs. Now, real quickly, I can tell you, I have a, I'm skeptical about this one sometimes because I, I could easily see myself writing a document where I talk about how much I love my family and how much I love my dog and how much I love teaching and how much I love guacamole. And I can assure you, I am using the word love inconsistently, right? I, I'm, I'm not using it to mean the exact same thing or in the exact same sense every time. And, but Sometimes when consistent use canon is applied uh, it, it, in an absolute way, they would sort of be saying like, look, this word means the, has the exact same sense every time it occurs in the same statute. And we'll leave it at that for now. The surplusage canon is the idea, it, it's sometimes expressed as every word should be given effect. And this can take on a couple different forms, but for our purposes here, this is when a court says, encounters sort of a broad a term that could be narrow or could be really broad um, in a statute. And the problem with giving it a broad, uh, taking it in its broader sense is that it makes a whole bunch of other stuff in the statute basically redundant or meaningless or sur that's what we mean by surplusage. Um, and they don't like to do that. Uh, courts don't like to do that. And sometimes in the extreme, we might assume that every single word in the statute is there for a reason. Again, I'm a little skeptical because 
human language, it does have a lot of built-in redundancy to aid in comprehension. But the idea is we shouldn't interpret a word that basically makes all of the other words like serve no purpose in the statute except to take up space. By the way, sometimes this canon can apply not just to other words, but whole provisions, right? If we interpret that word that way, that will make this whole other section of the statute meaningless. And so that's a surplusage canon. It's pretty useful, actually. Nociter associes has the hardest name because it's Latin, but it's actually the most uh, uh, intuitive of these three. This is the common sense assumption you've worked with your whole life that you can get some sense of the meaning of words from their immediate context, right? Look at how it's used in the sentence. That's what Nociter associes is, is looking at the na immediate neighbors or the words right around the word you're looking at. And, and so often this is focused on the other words in the same sentence to try to get a sense of how a word is being used and um, its context. Okay, now about the facts, and I'm going to try not to bore you to death, but it's not that interesting. So this is about um, a uh, selling a company, and you have some capitalists, uh, investors called Winpoint Partners who want to buy a company called Alloyd, which is owned by uh, this fellow Gustafson and a few of his friends. So they're the sole shareholders. This is not a publicly traded company. Um, so Winpoint Partners wanted to purchase it in the late 1980s, and they made a contract where they would basically buy all of the stock shares or almost all of them from uh, Gustafson and uh, so forth. What's confusing about this, and I just want to explain right here, is they did this thing where they also wanted to, they really liked the name Alloyd because it was a pretty well-known company. So they wanted to, they took on their name. So as soon as they bought Alloyd, they renamed their company, at least temporarily, Alloyd. And so Alloyd becomes the plaintiff in this case, even though it's the company that was being bought. That basically, they bought a company and then took on their name. All right, that's pretty boring. So the contract specified that the price included both the price of the stock and um, an additional, it, when you got the actual contract said uh, about 2 million, that according to explicit language in the contract reflected the increase in Alloyd's net worth due to its 1989 earnings, its year-to-date earnings, which presumably were not yet reflected in the stock price. And the declaration of the new added value was actually in the contract. So just to make sure you understand what happened here, they were negotiating on a, on, on a price and talking about um, the appraisal price of the company and, and so forth. But the sellers said, you know, we've had a really good year. We've had a lot of revenue come in. And so our uh, um, assets or the appraised value of the company doesn't really reflect the, what a, um, how much things have taken off this year uh, or re really you know, gone to the next level. And so we want to be paid for that, but we don't have our, let's say, our quarterly or year-end earnings report um, to prove it. So they had agreed before the contract, apparently. So we'll put a... But so tell you what, uh, when we find, are really ready to sit down and um, sign the contract, figure out what your year-to-date earnings are up to that point, and then it, we'll kind of round off and put some extra money in to reflect that new value, the growth of the company in the last year. And so right when they were ready to consummate the contract, Gustafson said, it's about 2 million for this year. And so that's what they put in the, so they show up and the contract says, um, basically it's a very, it's a more specific number I'm rounding, but basically the company has increased in value this amount um, so far this year. And so that's going to be added to the purchase price and they signed it. And so all of this kind of matters um, for whether this is going to count as a prospectus. So after the deal was done or consummated, Winpoint can really start going through the books and uh, digging around the company and figures out that this um, that things weren't quite so, hadn't been so great that year after all that the earnings in, in that year to date were lower than the estimates that were used 
um, right before they signed the contract to put in that clause for the final purchase price. And so Winpoint thought that the contract document therefore included some material misstatements about the company's earnings in order to get a higher contract price. And so they sued, which brings us to this case. Now, it's important to note here, Winpoint did not sue just for damages under standard breach of contract or bring a traditional fraud claim. They, somehow they were feeling burned by this and they just wanted to walk away from the deal. So they wanted their money back. And in contract law, we call that rescission of the contract. So this is a little different from seeking damages under a contract or seeking enforcement of the contract. They just wanted to undo the contract, get their money back and go away and pretend this never happened. They, and, uh, and think of it as when you go to the store and say, I wanna to talk to the um, supervisor or manager, I want my money back to return an item. And they were trying to do that with alloy. They wanted to um, talk to the supervisor and get their money back. All right, so the main question then before the court was whether this remedy, rescission of the contract, just undoing it, um, is really available under the laws uh, the federal laws about buying and selling stock, which we call securities regs. So what Winpoint did in order to get to have this particular remedy was they brought the suit under um, uh, section 12.2 of the Securities Act. And that section says a purchaser of securities is entitled to rescission to get their money back if the um, contract is made, uh, if the seller has made material misstatements by means of a prospectus. So the question here is whether this contract that they signed should count as a prospectus within the meaning of this provision. So they needed this section of the statute in order to get to just undo the deal and walk away from it. And then we have a definition section that says, when used in this subchapter, sub and by the way, part of why I like teaching this case is it introduces students to this idea of a definition section in the statute, something that I think is underappreciated, uh, at least for me, when I was in law school that I didn't fully understand. So the term prospectus means, according, and this is a definition section, and I'm quoting the statute, any prospectus, notice, circular, advertisement, letter, or communication, I put it in bold, written or by radio or television, which offers any security for sale or confirms the sale of any security. So look at that for a second. You can imagine that Winpoint, who needs to have the contract, this is the only place where they got this misrepresentation in writing from the other side and will be, can easily prove that they're something, uh, they relied on an untrue statement. They're trying to say that the contract is a communication and therefore is, fits under the definition of a prospectus. And, um, and then Gustafson is saying, no, it's not, uh, right? Communication can't mean anything, right? It can't, um, it, uh, it doesn't refer to uh, yelling, go team at your football game. That doesn't mean that now it's a prospectus. Okay, so note that um, section two defines prospectus as including not only a prospectus, but also any written communication that offers securities for sale. And so the plaintiffs here argue from kind of this, make a plain meaning argument that this permits rescission of a contract that has false info in it. And so that plain meaning argument sets up the counter argument, which is, uh, um, and includes a defendant's nociter associis argument that basically that really broad term communication, which could mean anything um, that is, uh, that that should be actually narrowed by the words around it and also a surplusage argument. And the court ends up ruling for Gustafson. So um, they don't get to undo the deal. Uh, Alloyd or Winpoint doesn't get to undo this contract. And they say the contract doesn't count as a prospectus, at least for purposes of this statute, which means no rescission of the contract. And they have three reasons. And that takes us to our three canons, the consistent use canon, the surplusage canon, and the nociter associates canon, which I explained kind of quickly at the beginning. Um, so let's work through these one by one. And I'm just putting this slide up again so you're not completely lost. By the way, I know you're getting bored and my dogs Lucy and Rosie want you to stay focused for just a few more minutes. I promise this will be over soon. Okay, 
The majority's first argument is that other sections of the same act expressly say that a prospectus is a document that includes the same information that's in a registration statement, which is a filing within a, a, a certain regulatory agency um, for public offerings, for documents related to public offerings by an issuer or its controlling shareholders. Well, this transaction that had happened wasn't really a public offering. And so um, the contract definitely didn't contain the same information as the registration filement that had been filed with the um, appropriate government agency. And so the, here's a, a quote. I've pulled out a few quotes for those of you who like to highlight in your casebook. Whatever else prospectus may mean, the term is confined to a document that, absent an overriding exemption, must include the information contained in the registration statement, which is another document that's filed beforehand with a regulatory agency. And so then they apply this consistent use canon. And I want you to see how this is used here. They say basic, they call it the normal rule is that quote, identical words used in different parts of the same act are intended to have the same meaning. So if you wanna see how the Supreme Court um, in recent decades has been defining the consistent use canon, that's your quote, identical words used in different parts of the same act are intended to have the same meaning. And they continue, um, oh, I'm sorry. And they continue on to the next canon, which I'm calling the surplusage canon. I think that's the most common term for it. Um, the court will, and we'll come back to that later, uh, what you should call it. The court will avoid a reading which renders some words altogether redundant. And so if communication included every written communication, it would render notice, circular, advertisement, and letter redundant, since each of these are forms of written communication as well. And I want you to think about this. This is an, a very interesting part of the case where we have this list of words. And the question is, is the legislature just trying to think of a whole bunch of different words for the same thing? Or does each of those words, is it, is it there for a reason because it applies to something slightly different than the others? And notice a little different than a circular and that's a little different than a letter and, and so forth. And if so, when we have the word communication in the list, we shouldn't interpret it in a way that basically a notice is also would be a communication, a circular is also a communication, advertisements are obviously communication in the general sense. And so they're saying this must be something narrower than something that would just um, kind of cancel out or make meaningless all the other words in the same sentence. Okay, um, the, by the way, the technical uh, Latin term for this that I hope you never encounter again for the rest of your life is verba cum affect accipienda sunt. And um, I took Latin in high school, but I don't assume anyone else would. And we usually, so we just usually call this a surplus or a surplusage canon or anti-surplusage or anti-superfluity canon. Um, and of which basically means avoid interpreting an unclear word in a way that makes other words in the statute or maybe even other whole provisions meaningless or redundant. So now the original way this was expressed was and the, what the Latin word kind of almost literally means is each word should have an effect or standalone meaning. And or another way of thinking this is everything is there for a reason, right? Every word was put in there deliberately and haggled over in a drafting committee and stuff like that. So if they put a word in, that word was supposed is supposed to be um, laden with meaning of its own. So don't interpret another word that makes everything else seem like just um, like the legislature was rambling and repeating itself. Okay, the, the majority then moves on to the Nossiter canon. And here's the way they explain it. I, again, I pulled out a quote to help you. A word is known by the company it keeps and they call this the doctrine of Nossiter associates. This rule we rely upon to avoid ascribing to one word a meaning so broad that it's inconsistent with its accompanying words, thus giving unintended breadth to the acts of Congress. Now, what's, part of what's interesting about this maneuver is they're basically taking this old Latin canon 
um, of look at the immediate, which just means look at the immediate context to get a sense of how the word is being used and, um, and reading and seeing that this is all about like separation of powers, right? That um, the, the legislature doesn't, would be thwarting the will of, the le of Congress. I'm sorry, the courts would be reading a statute to cover a lot more things in Congress intended um, if we don't apply this canon. That certainly raises the stakes a little bit. Okay, and now it apply. here's how the court applies the Nossiter canon. I know you're dying of curiosity. From the terms prospectus, notice, circular, advertisement, or letter, it is apparent that the list refers to documents of wide dissemination. Um, in other words, not something you give just to one person, right? So a notice, circulars, advertisements go to um, the general public. And in a similar manner, the list includes communications by radio or television, but not face-to-face -face or telephonic communications. Inclusion of the term communication in that list suggests that it too um, refers to a broad public communication and not a, con a private contract that only the buyer and seller and their lawyers were probably ever going to see. Okay, we have a couple of dissenting opinions. And one thing I wanna draw your attention to is that it's an unusual combination of justices who dissented. And this is a 5-4 opinion, but it did not split on party the usual conservative liberal lines. Instead, we have um, Scalia and Thomas teaming up with Ginsburg and Breyer. And the gist, uh, the main gist of both of the dissenting opinions is that the plain, the plain meaning rule should control. And especially if we have a statutory definition section, like we don't have to do any interpreting or apply any of these canons um, because we have a definition section and we can just follow that and give it the plain meaning. And that means that the contract would count as a communication and therefore as a prospectus and therefore Winpoint should be able to get out of this deal. Okay, now I know these canons can be confusing and I made a little diagram for you. I hope you find this helpful. Um, if you want to pause the video for just a minute to read these, sorry, the font is kind of small. Um, these, I think I picked out five canons that I think can be confusing for students because they're similar or overlap a little bit. Nociter associates is when we're talking about, we really look at other words in the same sentence. So you have a, a word or phrase in the statute that is uh, uncertain or unclear. So you can look at its immediate context to see how it's being used and what sense is it being used. Um, and then moving next door, we have in pari materia, which our casebook talks about mostly in the notes. And this is looking for the same word in other statutes, not the same act necessarily, but other statutes about the same matter. Look at the word materia. And so um, in other words, if this is a, a firearm case, which this one isn't, but we might look at other statutes in the federal code. You're, let's say you're bringing a conviction under section 18 USC 9, 922. Well, 924 also has a whole bunch of stuff about using guns and drug deals and stuff like that. So um, we might look around at other statutes about the same subject matter. And the assumption is that Congress is probably using the word the same way, at least in statutes about that. And maybe less so when we're if we're talking about guns, and then we look at an environmental law statute or something about um, retirement benefits um, and, and so forth. So, in pari materia is the idea that uh, uh, any other statute that's about the same subject matter, or let's we could use for guidance about what a confusing word means. A used them generous is when we have a catch-all phrase at the end of a list uh, of specific items, and those items share some common trait. And then we're going to assume that the catch-all phrase at the end is not absolute. It doesn't, it, they didn't mean to make the statute apply to every single thing in the world when they said, or any other blank. They mean other things that could have been on that list. The consistent use canon is 
the same word, but now we're looking at the same act. The, so the same actual statute. Not, and so this is a little narrower than in pari materia, where we might look at other statutes and enactments about the same matter. Here, we're just assuming, though, well, at least this Congress, and, and there's some common, something intuitive about this, probably the same drafting committee worked on one statute, one act. So maybe they, we can assume that they kind of used the, a word the same way. And then the surplusage canon is don't interpret one word so broadly that it makes other words redundant or meaningless. And um, in other words, every word is there for a reason and should be given a meaning. Okay, that concludes our lecture about the statutory interpretation in Gustafson v. Alloyd Company. <laughs>